next thing I'd like to talk about are therapies for heart failure. So we've already talked about the medications and the many medications that they might have. Well, other things that your heart failure patients might experience or get, um, one of those things is a specialized pacemaker. Some heart failure patients have an electrical delay in their heart muscle contraction. And this delay is usually caused from a bundle branch block. So as the disease infiltrates the heart muscle, it can delay conduction through the ventricles, and that's how they develop a bundle branch block. So the heart chambers contract out of sync, and the heart function is less effective. So basically one side of the heart contracts first, and then the, second, then the other side does. So the right side might contract right just before the left side. So there's no forceful contraction together, and that decreases the heart's pumping efficiency. So what we want to do is make the chambers contract together, and that's what the biventricular pacemaker does. Uh, we put a lead in the left side and a lead on the right, and they fire at the same time. Another one that's very common, and I'm sure you will see patients with this, is the internal cardiodefibrillator, or ICD. It's an implanted device. It looks like a pacemaker, but what it does is it monitors the heart rhythm 24-7, and if the patient develops a serious, life-threatening heart rhythm, it will shock it within seconds. Just like we would use the paddles in the emergency room or during a code, this does the same thing internally. Precautions that we have to take, um, you know, patients will say, oh, I can't have a microwave if I have a defibrillator or a pacemaker, and that's no longer the case. The only real uh, precaution that we ask them to take are to avoid large electromagnetic fields like an MRI, or uh, security when they go to the airport, so they have to be wanded. Um, also, other things that have, micro, or that have uh, uh, magnets are cell phones. So I just have my patients just be careful with their cell phone. If they're uh, a man and they like to carry their cell phone in their, their shirt pocket, I tell them just move it to the other side, on the opposite side of where the pacemaker is or the defibrillator is. Avoid talking um, on the phone on that same side, just move the phone over to the other side. Again, these are very sensitive to magnets. Um, it's kind of drawbacks about these things is they have to be monitored you know, uh, regularly, so they need to see their pacemaker doctor about every three months. But um, there's now uh, we have the ability to regulate these at home, so patients can have a monitor at home and transmit data to their doctor. So um, they're just getting easier to use, we're using these a lot more in patients. Um, let me tell you about who gets these uh, devices. A defibrillator, typically the time that we implant them is when, after the patient's been put on maximal me medical therapy. So they're on a diuretic, we've added the ACE inhibitor, they're on a maximum dose of beta blocker, and we usually let about three months go by on max maximal medical therapy. Then we go back in and we measure that ejection fraction by either an echo or a heart cath, um, but typically an echocardiogram because it's non-invasive. And then when we do the echo, we're looking again at the ejection fraction. So our goal is to get the ejection fraction over 35%. If their ejection fraction is over 35% on these medicines, we don't really need to put in a defibrillator. If their ejection fraction doesn't meet that 35 percent mark, then we talk to them about a defibrillator. So during this time where they're waiting for the three months, uh, many times doctors like to put what we call a life vest on these patients. And basically it's an external defibrillator, and you may have seen these. It, um, it looks like a, um, a vest with suspenders, and there's pads that are attached to the front and the back. And the patients wear these 24-7, except when they're in the shower and it will monitor the rhythm and will shock the patient if it ne they need a shock. But they're very cumbersome, patients find them very difficult to wear, and so you know, most of the time these are very short-lived. Short They'll wear them a week or two and then go in and get their defibrillator. The next thing we'll talk about is a VAD, or a ventricular assist device. Uh, you probably won't ever see these in practice, but I just wanted to mention them because they're becoming more and more common. Um, back in the day, remember when Barney Clark got the first artificial heart? Well, think of Barney Clark and where we've come. We now have these small pumps that we can place in the chest, right 
at the, at the bottom of the heart, um, at the bottom of the left ventricle, to boost the blood flow. So we put this pump in, patient has um, a, a line that comes outside of the abdomen that plugs into batteries, and they wear a battery pack with them when they're out, and then at night they plug themselves into a battery pack and just keeps this unit going and keeps it, it, it functioning. And so we're seeing these a lot more because we're putting patients on these devices while they're waiting for heart transplant, or we've now been approved to use them as um, a long-term therapy or what we call destination therapy. So some of our patients who are not transplant candidates or who do not want a transplant will get one of these um, assist devices put in if their symptoms are very, very severe and we can't keep them out of the hospital.